morning, we're continuing in what I call a series that is just touching on timely truths. And, and it's a desire to raise our awareness of certain realities that God gives us in His Word, certain realities of how God's Word works in our lives. And all these things are designed to both strengthen and stretch our faith. And we covered a few weeks ago, we covered the issue of spiritual warfare, spiritual battles. Last week we, we looked at the whole question of where do we find hope? And this week we're moving back a few chapters in Romans. We're looking at Romans chapter 12. Next week we're going to look at the next section of verses Next week, we're also going to emphasize, I don't know how we're going to do the application of this, we're going to emphasize prayer for the persecuted church next week. The whole month of November is the, the month when we remember the persecuted church. And the passage we look at next week, verse 14, says that we should, uh, we should, not, we should bless those that persecute us and not curse them. So we're going to look at the whole issue. This week we're looking at the, at the question of how do we relate to each other? How do we as followers of Jesus Christ who are supposed to be brothers and sisters, members of a family, how do we relate to each other? And next week, how do we relate to the world around us? And that's what we're, we're doing. So the, today, the, the title of the message, and it, it comes from the first verse of the passage, we need to remove our masks. Removing our masks... And that brings about caring commitment at its very best. Caring commitment one to another at its very best. We need to remove our masks. And I just ask the question, how does our love for one another show? How does it show? What practical things do we do to express love for each other? I was told, and I see that it's true, I was told this, well, actually getting close to three years ago now. In three weeks, it'll be three years ago that I interviewed for this position face-to-face -face here in, in Appleton with, with the search committee. And I was told about the characteristics of this congregation that, that you were a congregation filled with mercy. I see that's true. We are filled with mercy. And that's a good thing. But how does that mercy translate to the issue of our commitment in caring for each other in the best way possible? And I find it that the Scriptures reveal to us time and time again the importance of how we do relate to each other, and yet we sometimes we put that stuff down on a lower level. And, and I don't think the Bible wants us to do that. I, I, an illustration as I start. Back when I was first asked to be a member of the school board at Peoria Christian School a number of years ago, I, I thought I knew the Christian community relatively well in the Peoria area, but I learned it better there because what I found was there's a group of churches down there and, and I, I don't necessarily recommend them or not recommend them. As I say this, I'm using them as an illustration, but they're called the Apostolic Christian Churches. And, and this group is a very conservative group. I'm going to your right, my left, but you're right, they're very conservative. And they have some pretty strict rules and regulations. They have about three different degrees of churches. They have the strictest group, which are called the black stocking group. And then they have the middle of the road group, which they're very strict. They're stricter than what we are. And then they have the group that they've even allowed music in their, in their sanctuaries. See, these groups, they, they, they for years have sung a cappella. And the one thing that I want to say about this group is that I've never seen a group of people that take care of each other better than they do. And, and as I say that, you won't find a poor person in the, in the whole lot even though there are poor people in there. You won't find anybody in that group that's going hungry even though there are people that don't have money to buy their groceries. And they stand, uh, they stand and, 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 and they've got each other's backs. 
I, I'm, I'm amazed as I, as I look at how that church operates. And God's Word tells us that that's the way we're supposed to be. In fact, what happens is, and I know this to be the case, I've talked to many people, says, you know what? People were so intrigued by the way they took care of people, of each other, that they went to those churches and they, they stopped going because they said, well, they were way too strict for me. But boy, I certainly did like the way they took care of each other. And I say that because how does our love for one another show? Does the world around us see that we care for each other or do they stop back and say, you know what, those Christians, they have a hard time getting along with each other. Because I hear that sometimes too. So how, how, how does our love for one another show? Or, or is it hidden behind a mask? Hidden behind a mask. And as I ask that question, you know, there, there's the whole issue of what it says in the first verse we're going to look at today in Romans chapter, nine, chapter 12, verse 9. Let your love be without hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. Hupo kritas. Hupo means under. Kritas means a mask. Hypocrisy means that we're living behind a mask. And we need to remove our mask sometimes. And what we need to do, and we, we, we used this last week, we're going to use it again today, we need to stop. We need to look. And we need to listen. And that's important. We're going to look at those things later. But now what I want to do is I want to introduce our message with three concepts, three, three ideas, important ideas that, that introduce what we're looking at today in Romans chapter 12. And these are a foundation, so to speak. They kind of lay a foundation for us of truth that we have to, we have to accept this in order to make this message applicable. So as I say that, first thing I want us to see, and this is not my message, this is not what I'm preaching on, but these are truths that I want us to get hold of, and that is that one of the most practical tests to determine if we are faithful followers of Christ or not is how well we love each other. One of the most practical tests is that, and, and here's one verse that I pulled out of the Scriptures that would say that. Jesus says, I give you a new commandment to love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Everyone will know this, know by this that you are my disciples, that you are my followers, if you have love for one another. So it's a practical test that if our love for each other shows, then hey, it's more likely that we're faithful followers of Christ. Secondly, a person's genuine and sincere love for God. How many of y'all love God today? Most everybody, raise your hand. You know what? We say that, but there's several passages in God's Word that suggest it's easy for us to say we love God and then it doesn't show in our lives because how does our love for God show? It shows in our love for each other. And very simply, a person's genuine and sincere love for God always, not sometimes, not maybe, but always spills over into an active and authentic affection for one another. And I think it's vital that we understand that. And why is it the world looks at the church and says, you know, I don't know if I want any part of those people. And some of it is because of the way we respond to things. The way we are. I've gotten in the devotions an illustration, and I'll say this right now. I wasn't even going to use this morning, but I met a man named Mike years ago. He was a grad student at a Christian grad school, and he was studying sacred music. Mike grew up in a very rigid, strict home, and... He professed to be an agnostic. And I said, well, I don't get this. Why are you studying sacred music? You're going to make a career out of this, but you don't even know for sure that you believe God exists. 
And he says, well, the truth is, he says, I grew up in such a strict, rigid home and such a stra- strict church. He says that I personally believe that all people that claim to be Christians are hypocrites. They're all hypocrites. And, and my first reaction to Mike was, well, that's a cop-out. But yet, when I look not with necessarily a negatively critical eye, but when I look with just an observant eye, it's sometimes how the church operates and how it operates in, in our culture today. I have to confess that there's a bit of hypocrisy sometimes in our midst. And, you know, where do we get a verse for that? 1 John 4 says, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And that passage goes on to say that we can claim to love God but not love our brother, and then our love for God gets gets questioned. And then thirdly, this morning, as we introduce, as we begin to prepare for our our passage, I want us to realize that genuine and sincere love for others, for one another, shows itself as a sacrificial caring commitment. There's sacrifice that's involved. Love never is easy. And there's a sacrificial caring commitment that's involved, and that is always seeking the highest good of the one who is loved. You know, that's what agape love stands for. That's what agape love means. It is a deep devotion to someone in that we always seek the highest good of the person that's being loved. And I think it's key that we realize that. And where do we get something for that? Well, John 15, verses 12 and 13. Jesus, this is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. So, we have all that. Now, we're going to look at Romans 12, verses 9 through 13 today. And as we do that, the first verse, verse 9. As I I look at verse 9, as I try to to explain what it says and how it works in our lives, I want to just call this the idea of dealing with some confusion about love. There's a lot of confusion out there about love. It goes back thousands of years probably, but remember, how many of y'all remember the the, the movie, and, and I'm dating myself now, Love Story? Love means you never have love means you never have to say you're sorry. False. False. Untrue. And there's a lot of confusion about love starting with that kind of thing. And, and you know, we confuse the idea of liking and loving. Loving and liking are not the same thing. And, and I'm not giving anybody freedom for this, no liberty in this one, but I'm going to say the Bible never tells us to like each other. You'd be hard-pressed to find any verse in the Bible that says, thou shalt like each other. We shall love each other, yes, but liking is a different thing. And there's so many factors that go into that. I don't have time. I won't even try. But we're going to get rid of some confusion about love. When we look at the verse there, verse 9 of chapter 12, it says, Let love be without hypocrisy. No false identities, no masks, no pretending, just sincerity. Then he goes on and he ties these things together. These things are right next to each other in the text where it says, Abhor what is evil and cling as much as you can to what is good. And I believe that that verse, as I study this passage, and, and realize something. This, this is just this is free for the asking here. The Bible is, was written by Paul. He didn't write it in verses. 
He didn't divide it up. Well, verse 9 says this. In fact, Paul had no way of referring to verse 9 or verse 10 or verse 12. Because that's been done after the fact. And the Bible is written in complete thoughts by the writer that wrote it with the power of the Holy Spirit guiding him. And we're supposed to read it in complete thoughts with the power of the Holy Spirit guiding our interpretation. And I think that, you know, I, I always look at the Bible, I look at the Scriptures, and I try to find the flow of thought. I try to find, what is this saying? What's the point here? Not, can I grab this verse and make it my life verse and it can be oh so happy? I don't do that. Oh, I have a life verse, but I don't take it out of its context. I look and see what was Paul really saying when he, when he wrote that verse. But I believe that verse 9 is the central idea for what Paul is saying in all five of these verses. Verses 9-13. through 13. And what it does is it establishes a foundation of truth that shapes our understanding of the verses 10-13. through 13. It establishes a focal point that says, you look at these next several verses in view of what verse 9 says. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil and just cling with all your might to what is good. And then when you apply the rest of those verses with that in mind, it kind of changes the application to some extent. And it emphasizes how sincere, honest, and righteous love that sets a standard for how faithful followers of Christ relate to one another. And it's, it's important that we see that. And we're going to see that here in a moment here. Because the first thing we see from verse 9 there, love should have no secret or selfish, or selfish agenda. And, you know, I, I, I like Gary Chapman. The guy that wrote the book, The Five, the Five Love Languages. And what I've got to tell you is the love languages, practically speaking, there's a lot of correct stuff there. But you know what? He's confusing the, dis, the discussion about love when he talks about love languages in view of, of how we get people on our side or whatever else. And, and I think that, that when I am loving to get my own way, when I'm loving to make life easier, when I'm loving for my own self-interest, I'm violating what this passage says. Love should have no secret or selfish agenda. None. And as we look at that, let, let realize the, the words that are used there. The word hypocrisy. I said it already. It's to hide your true identity under a mask. It's to hide your true identity. So therefore, don't, don't pretend. We need to get rid of the mask. We need to deal with the source problem as to why we can't love or don't love. And the idea of love, literally he uses the word agape there. And agape is a deep affection that is expressed by seeking the absolute best interests of the one who received the affection. And I think it's vital that we see that. And, and, and what do we get from that? The bottom there of the screen, it says, sincere affection that is not tainted by selfish ambition or secret agenda. And we need to work towards saying, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to use love as a hammer. I'm not going to use love as, as a switch that that turns on making life easier for myself or whatever else. That's a wrong use of love. That's not the way God uses love. And I think we have to realize that. And going a little bit farther then, what do we find here? We find that love without hypocrisy. Honest and genuine love doesn't take an unfair advantage of someone else.
Honest and genuine love doesn't pretend or play a role in order to satisfy some selfish desire. Honest and genuine love doesn't have sinful or selfish motives in showing concern or compassion for others. I had a call yesterday from someone here in the congregation that just wanted to ask me some Bible questions. And you know what? If I have the moments to give, I love answering Bible questions. That, that kind of turns me on. And, and th- this person was asking a little bit about, you know, the idea of, of our motives. And you know, when our motives become twisted, a lot of difficult problems begin to develop. And we need to make sure that we have the appropriate motives in expressing love and expressing concern for each other. And even to the point where what, what it was is this person had been sharing the gospel with some co-workers. And the response that, that he was getting, and, and I, I can say I've had the same response, is that a lot of people think, well, you know what? As long as my good stuff outweighs my bad stuff, God's going to be okay with it. Now, we know that's not the gospel, but you want to know something? Most of us operate that way. We operate that way, and, and, and we have motives that sometimes are not as, as clean or pure as what they ought to be. So, let's realize that love without hypocrisy, it, it's all three of those things there. It doesn't take an unfair advantage of others. It doesn't pre- pretend or play a role to satisfy some selfish desire that we have. And there's no sinful or selfish motives in the fact that, well, I'll help this person and then I'm going to get something good in return. That's never what God desires. Second thing here in in this first verse, there's verse 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. And in that, what's Paul saying? He's saying that love never supports what's evil. It never supports what is evil. It it never supports what is wrong. And it always stands with what is good. And you know what? If we could have relationships like that in our midst, we could deal with a lot of the issues that develop that we don't tend to deal with very well. Let me just give you an illustration. And, and I, I, can't, I, I can't do much about this one because I don't have a strong relationship with this, but I, I was at a, at a ministerial meeting this week. And one of the men at the meeting, one of the senior pastors at the meeting, he told a big, fat, bold lie. And I knew it was a lie. And, you know, as you look at that... now. The problem is, is I don't have a close relationship with this guy and he'd look at me as being judgmental. I don't think I'd get a good reaction if I said it, but you know what? When people do that, love, the most loving thing to do in, in most people's eyes is, well, you know, I just ignore it. Pretend like it didn't happen. But when we pretend like, that, like something like that doesn't happen, what do we do? We're only causing a spiral, a downward spiral for more problems. And, uh, you know, we, we often think, in fact, let me go farther with this. Let me go on and, and, and go to the next little section here I'm trying to say, show. The passage itself, the words itself, abhor what is evil, it says. Abhor. Literally, that word is marked by fear or terror that results in disgust or hatred. To abhor evil is to be shocked by it. Whoa! And to say, I, 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 can't, I can't take that. I abhor evil. And evil in this passage, it's interesting, there are two different words in, Rome, in Romans 12 for the word evil, for the translation of evil. And in this one, this is the one case where it's expressed in this particular word. And the word that's used here, the Greek word means absolute wickedness. 
You can't get any darker than that. It's talking about a dangerous influence that leads to destruction. And all of us ought to recognize when that type of darkness, when that type of evil is around, we've got to abhor it. And what we find from that, faithful followers of the Lord should avoid anything that has even any hint of evil and wickedness. We need to be so careful. And I think it's vital that we understand that. Now that last section there, cling to what is good. Cling, literally the Greek word there means to be glued to something and inseparably joined together. It's the same word that is used to describe the, the beams that were used to build the temple in, 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 in Israel. Because those beams had to be glued and laminated together in such a way that if they come apart, the whole building's falling down. So he says, cling, be glued to what is good and inseparably joined to it. And what's good there? Good literally means inherently right and worthy. It is the complete and total opposite of evil. Diametrically on the opposite side. And he's telling us here that faithful followers of Christ, what should we do? We should tightly hang on to anything that we know to be good. God's Word. God's truth. And the impact of God's grace and what He does in our lives. And so therefore, as we kind of let this play out a little bit, I got ahead of myself a couple moments ago and I want to do this more logically because I've got it laid out in a way that I think is more understandable than I was starting to say a moment ago. Love that is selfish or or self-centered. Let's realize, what is it? It is always, number one, driven by evil influences. Always. By our sin nature. It is always destructive and dangerous. And it's always detached from what's moral and holy. Always. So therefore, let's look at this. and, And... Dig in with me. Think with me. And let's see what this is saying here. Because often, way too often, our moral decisions and judgments, we decide what's right and wrong. How do we respond to somebody else? How do we deal with somebody else? How do we deal with problems of sin? Moral decisions and judgments are determined by a desire for us to do what is loving based on the social standards. Based on what society thinks. And what society say? Society says there's no absolute truth. Society says that, hey, it's okay to lie if, if, if it's in the other person's, you know, if it's going to help that other person as we think. Now, faithful followers of Christ should recognize that what is loving should include what is right and moral. I'm not talking about a rigid legalism here. I'm not talking about a judgmental, sta- 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 st- a, a judgmental state of affairs. But we have to understand that doing the most loving thing involves the other person's best interests according to God's standards. Doing the loving thing involves the best interests according to what God's standards are. So, how many times do we think the most loving thing, how many times do we realize that maybe that's going to lead us into something that isn't necessarily best for us or that other person? You know, I've had lots of people through the years tell me, you know, you can tell me anything. You can tell me whatever. You know, if, if, there, if you see something wrong in my life, just let me know. Well, I can tell you very honestly that when people say that, usually they don't mean it. And there have been plenty of times when I've, 
I've treaded into thin ice because I've said things that the person really didn't want to hear. But yet, we've got to look at what does God desire in that? And I think that it's vital that, you know, this, you know, understand, this is a framework. This is a foundation for us to understand the rest of what this passage says. And the rest of the passage isn't particularly complicated. It's actually quite simple and straightforward, but yet we need to apply it to the way we treat each other. And as we draw clues close to, to this section of the message, realize that love that is sincere, honest, and righteous, what's it going to be? It's going to be discerning between what is wrong, what is good, what is better, or what is best for the one who is receiving the love that we're showing. So therefore, we jump to the rest of the passage. In the next little section here, I'm calling this, what, what should we be known for? And the reality is we should be known for our love. We should be known for the way we love each other, the way we love God and love each other. We should be known for that. That should be our reputation. We find the passage in Romans 12. We look first at verses 10 and 11. Where it says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference. Give priority to one another with honor. Not lagging behind in diligence. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Now, I've already pointed this one out. Jesus taught His disciples they'll know we are His followers. By our love. The world sees that. And in Romans 12, Paul is teaching us a couple things that are pretty relevant, pretty vital. Because number one, we find that we should be devoted and dedicated to one another like we're a close-knit family. And we defend each other. We've got each other's backs. You know, families should stick together. They should support one another. They should serve each other why? Because we love without hypocrisy. And when we look at the terms here, realize being, be devoted to one another in brother love, what's it mean? Literally, it's funny, I had to translate this two or three times to make sure I was getting it right. Because what, what's Philadelphia? It's the city of brotherly love, right? Well, I'm looking at this passage and I'm seeing the word Philadelphia, but it's not in the right spot. And what I find is, is the way we translate this verse, it's the word devoted literally is the word Philadelphia. And it's saying that devotion toward one another is a family-style brotherly affection that we hold on to. We have a brotherly affection. And he says secondly in that verse, he says, be devoted to one another. What? In brotherly love. That's not the word Philadelphia. That's another word. Literally, it's two words. It's the word love, not agape, but phileo. And it's the word storge, which means you store up love. Or basically, as I've tried to explain here on, 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 the, on the, the notes, brotherly love is a mutual affection that is typically seen within family members. It's a dedicated commitment toward one another. And I realize siblings sometimes fight and argue and there's jealousy and there's competition. But you know what? When it comes right down to it, when siblings, even when that's the case, siblings tend to stand for each other. Remember a time when my sister was in the seventh grade? I was a junior in high school. You know what it's like to have a seventh grade sister when you're a junior in high school? She's always a pest. One time she was coming back from a school activity on the bus at night and I was given the responsibility to go down and pick her up. So I drove down to pick her up and, and she gets off the bus and she's sobbing. She's just crying her eyes out. And the reality is I had other things to be doing at that, moment in time, that point in time, so why do I have to pick up my sister? But She's crying. She tells me what happened, and, and, and 
one of the young men in her class, it had nothing to do with immorality or anything like that, but he had he'd basically been very mean and cruel to her. And, okay, I was 17 years old, and this kid here was probably 13 or 12, so I had no business, you know, and I didn't try to pick any argument or fight with him. But in my, you know what, suddenly the, the disgust and, and the fact that I had to go pick up my sister and take time that I didn't want to do, suddenly that all went away. Because I wanted to defend my sister. And that's what we as church members should be. Defending each other. There's that sense of devotion and dedication. A commitment toward each other that says, hey, I'm for you. And to be descriptive in, in, in a cliche-ish way, using an idiom, Strong attachment, brotherly, family love, it results in what? An all-for-one and one-for-all attitude. It results in a togetherness that says we have each other's backs. The next phrase here, the next statement, he says give preference to one another in honor. Literally, that word preference means priority toward the other person. It describes an unselfish, Christ-like willingness to give up one's rights for the sake of another. And when you stop and look at that, you think, wait a minute, am I willing to give up my rights for the other people in our church? And I'm not sure I want any vocal answers on that one. Because the reality is, is that's not an easy thing to do. He's saying there we should give preference, priority to one another, give each other up his rights with a sense of honor, a sense of admiration, a sense of respect, a sense of sincere humility towards self. And that results in compassionate concern for others. Literally what he's saying there is a sincere love that we have for one another. It's sacrificial. It's going to cost us something. It's not easy. And as we break that down a little bit, what we find is that the being devoted to each other and brotherly love, giving preference to one another, faithful followers of the Lord, what? We're like family members who value and support one another. We provide a climate, an atmosphere of safety and security. We stand up and defend one another. And that should be one of our priorities. Now going on to the next little section here, he says our service and support should, in fact, for one another, be motivated by diligence and determination. He uses the word diligence there. He's saying that our efforts and our enthusiasm should involve not lagging behind in diligence. Why? Because we are fervent in spirit and we're serving the Lord. And I think it's important that we realize when we bring a meal to somebody or when we help somebody else in our congregation in some particular need they have, we're not just serving that person. We're serving the Lord. And that's key that we understand that. And as we, we look at it, not lagging behind a diligence, literally the terms that he uses there, diligence. <clears throat> that is an enthusiastic eagerness that's coupled with a keen sense of observation towards one another. In other words, we're eagerly watching for how we can help each other. He uses the same, in that same phrase, he says, not lagging behind. In other words, not allowing laziness, indifference, or sluggishness to set in. And... You know, it's interesting how he's basically he's giving us a prescription here for burnout. But it's funny, I, I don't see any, any counteracting ideas that say, okay, protect yourself from burning out. No, he's saying if you're doing this, if everybody's doing this, what happens? None of us burn out. 
Because we're all actively involved in serving each other. And we are always ready to act when necessary. When he talks about this, he's, he's basically saying that lagging, not lagging behind in diligence, what is it? It's observing one another out of love and concern. Watching to say, how, how can I love better? How can I be a service to people? It's being aware and alert about the difficulties and dangers that are out there. And it's about maintaining an appropriate, proper focus and perspective toward one another. In fact, we'll define that better next week when we define the whole question of who are our enemies? Who are our enemies? We'll define that next week when we, when we get to that. And the next phrase here, he says, be fervent in spirit. Fervent in spirit. Fervent in spirit seems to refer to being faithful to the guidance and the prompting of God's Holy Spirit. In fact, as I, as I tore that apart and as I looked to see what is he saying here, I think he's basically saying that we should be, the word fervent literally means to be on fire. To be on fire. We should be on fire in the Spirit. We should be listening carefully. What's the Spirit telling me to do? What do the Scriptures say for my responsibility and how does the Holy Spirit guide me in that? You know, it's interesting. I think that logically follows the idea of not lagging behind in diligence. We get the Holy Spirit involved, but we are, we are, we are sensitive to the leading of God's Spirit to His call and we are submissive to one another in mutual love. Serving the Lord, literally, I think that once again, I think that's kind of an inclusive statement. It's a statement that is basically used there as, as, a, as a comment that just, it means ministry. Serving the Lord refers to the ministry and responsibility that God's given each of us. There's not a person that claims to be a follower of Christ that is not called to full-time service. It may not be a career service, but it's full-time service. We're all called into ministry. So we get to the last section here and we go through this relatively fast. Because the question is, we see this, love without hypocrisy, abhor what's evil, cling to what's good. Be devoted, dedicated, diligent in, in watching and seeing how we can serve each other. But what are the practical steps we take? What makes love practical? Look at the passage. He says, beginning with verse 11, he says, serving the Lord, we're all called to ministry, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, and practicing hospitality. These instructions relate back to that central idea in verse 9. No hypocrisy in our love. Take the masks out. Begin sharing and serving in such a way that we're together. We're a family. And we abhor what's evil when we cling to what's good. We cling to each other. And basically, six things. Love encourages humility. It encourages humility. And I think the idea of serving the Lord, it's impossible for us to do without eliminating that sense of selfish pride. And we need to be modeling the humility of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We need to just kind of put aside all the pride, all that selfish perspective, me, 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 me. No, I'm serving the Lord Jesus and I'm serving with the model that He gave me of humility. There's humility that's always involved in the love of service. The love of ministry. Or the ministry of love. Maybe I should have said it that way. Secondly, love expands our sense of hope. It expands our sense of hope. He says rejoice in hope. That involves recognizing everything that God has promised and provided to us through His grace. Step back and say, well, look at all what God's done. 
Look at all that He's given. Look at everything that He's provided. And I realize these promises and these provisions, the faithfulness, all of that, that amounts to, I have hope. I have a future that is guaranteed. Third, love enlarges our perseverance. Love enlarges our ability to persevere. When we've got each other's backs, when we're defending each other, when we're supporting each other, when we're serving each other, our ability to persevere, the trials and the tribulations of life expands. It enl- it, 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 we enlarge that. Perseverance is, an essential, is essential as we trust in the Lord. As we trust together in the Lord, I could say. We have the foundation of hope and we find Him forever faithful. The, the, the praise team sang that song, Forever He is Faithful. We find the Lord forever faithful. We have to realize trials, temptations, turmoil, they're all part of life because we live in a sin-saturated society. Sin surrounds us. We should never lose sight of what it says in Romans 8, verses 8 through 39, 18 through 39. Verse 18 basically says the sufferings of this life are nothing compared to the glory that comes later. Verse 28 says, and we know that God causes everything that happens in our lives to work together for our good. And then verses 38 and 39 says, there's nothing at all in this world, no tribulation, no trial, no trouble that can separate me from the love of Christ. Perseverance. Fourthly, love emphasizes prayer for each other. Prayer is an encouraging privilege and an energizing priority that we all enjoy. And we should consistently encourage one another through prayer. I want to clarify something as I, as I draw some conclusions here today. And I say this because maybe I think there are sometimes misunderstandings that we have with what we say to each other. Somebody recently asked me, you know, you tell a lot of people you pray for them, and this has nothing to do with somebody that teased me this morning, said I was bragging. Nothing to do with this, okay? In fact, it was packed into the, my illustrations today, and when you said it, I thought, oh, do I want to use it or not? Somebody said, you know, when you, when you say you pray for people, are you bragging? I was taken aback. No, I'm not. You want to know something? If it looks like I'm bragging, forgive me. It's not a brag. When I tell you or when I say I'm praying for a person, it is strictly to be an encouragement. And I think prayer is an encouraging privilege that we have as we pray for each other. And it's an energizing priority that we enjoy because you know what? There's nothing that energizes me. You know, I, I've made it clear, I, I walk a lot of times when the weather's nice on Sunday afternoon, I'll take a long walk, miles. You know what I'm doing if I'm not on the phone when I'm walking? In fact, my kids refuse to call me when they know I'm taking a walk because they say, Dad's praying. Don't want to break up that prayer. Got a couple of pastor friends that called me. Well, last Sunday afternoon, somebody saw me and I was talking to one of my my pastor friends. Reality is, is when I'm walking those miles, I don't even count the miles. I just pray. And I'm energized. I am so energized by the opportunity to commune with my Heavenly Father. And we should consistently encourage each other through prayer. Love elevates our desire to meet each other's needs. It elevates our desire to meet each other's needs. Contributing to the needs of the saints. And notice this is to the saints there. And as I say this, that doesn't mean that we don't help other people. But you know what? We don't help, we don't necessarily, we're not called to help every person that, that walks in the door. But we are called to help each other. And this requires us to be open and aware of one another's needs. 
We ought not hide those needs. We ought to let it be known in, in, in a proper way. And it attacks our pride. Because we have both the opportunity to give and sometimes we have the opportunity to receive. And that's what contributing to the needs of the saints is all about. And finally, love enables us to make everyone feel welcome. It enables us to make everyone feel welcome because what does he say there? He says, practicing hospitality. And that is a very specific description of helping others to feel welcome. Helping others to feel safe. That's a big issue these days. I don't feel safe. I think some of the discussion of safe places on college campuses and whatnot, I think some of the discussion is way out of whack. But some of it is needed. Because our world isn't necessarily safe. And our church should be a safe place. A place where we can take off the mask. Express to each other, you know what? I'm struggling with this. It makes the church a comfort zone. So what do we say here? We stop. We look. We listen. We stop, look, and listen because... It's time to step back from the fast-paced aspect of our culture sometimes. Step back from all the hurry, 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 worry, 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 worry. We look one another in the eye. We look each other in the eye. And we take off the masks of hypocrisy. We don't have to pretend. And we ask in an honest and humble way, hey, how you doing? How can we support and serve one another? When a church has a reputation of that, a church is giving great glory and honor to God. And as we just draw the last thoughts here, we love without secret agendas or selfish ambitions. We have an honest, sincere concern and compassion for each other. We're seeking the highest good for everyone based on God's standards of what is good. And we claim this as a promise, as a perspective, and we know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love Him and who are called according to His purpose. Let's pray. Father God, I, I, I don't have any idea exactly what might be on people's minds right now. Actually, I, I just feel a, a, a need to quiet my own voice. And as Ken and the music team comes and prepares to lead us in a closing song. I pray that, God, you might help us all do business with you in the ways that we need to. Some of us maybe need to formulate a strategy on how to become more loving to each other. Some of us need to step back and say, you know what, I need to start admitting that I've got some struggles. Some of us need to look around and ask, how can we make this place the comfort zone that it's supposed to be? I praise You that we have wonderful people here that love You and love each other. I praise You for that, Father. I don't preach this message because I sense a problem with what's going on here. But Father, You know I'm preaching this message because I sense a problem with what's going on in our world. And we need each other so desperately. So please, take care of us today as we try to follow the guidance of what this...
passage teaches us. And I pray this in Jesus' name and for God's, for your sake. Amen.